So uh, we're going to talk to you uh, about uh, self-publishing, starting up uh, your own company, just being a scrappy, savvy business person while doing something that you love and trying not to crush your soul. Uh, <laughs> We'll do a little, we'll do short introductions. We'll try to, we'll tell you uh, a little bit about ourselves and our, our companies, I guess, since this <laughs> seems to be business focused. Uh, and uh, and then we'll pretty much just open it up to questions. I don't think any of us are going to lecture. No. No. So. Uh, not on Sunday, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I'll, I, I may, I'll, I'll try to keep things moving. I may cut you off or, you know, say, you know, tell you we can address that later or something like that. But uh, otherwise, uh, we'll keep it open. So we'll start. Start down here for introductions. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Chad Long. I'm, I work with Jay as part of Fire Opal Media. We've got a number of projects uh, on, the, on the books, uh, in particular one uh, coming out within weeks called 13th Age. It's a new tabletop RPG. I'm working personally on the online version of the 13th Age uh, game uh, to be coming out um, not within a couple of weeks, but to be coming out. Uh, <laughs> as, as part of my day job, I work in a decidedly, I work in the games industry, digital games, decidedly not startup, but I have a lot of on the side startup experience. So I hope I can share some of that with you today. Okay. Excellent. Hi, I'm McGay Baker. I am the creative person behind Nightscape Games. I do independent role playing game design and publishing. Um, there's lots of games that I do them, I play them and stuff. And in my other world, I am a textile conservation specialist at the museum. So that's that. Hi, I'm Jay Schneider. Um, so I basically handle the day-to-day -day operations for Fire Opal Media. By the way, can you all hear me back there? Yeah. Good, good, yeah. I want to make sure my volume was set. Um, <coughs> anyway, so Fire Opal Media is a fairly new game company that we run. 13th Age is our first product, and as Chad said, it will be going to, we're being printed through Pelgrane Press, and it will be coming to stores near you very soon, and it's already open for pre-order. In addition to handling the day-to-day -day operations for Fire Opal, I teach at the UW, and I teach game design in their certificate program. Uh, my background is, I am actually probably have the most insanely formal background <laughs> in game design. I worked in Wizards R&D, went in as an intern through their training program, um, developed games, and basically am best known because I produced and designed uh, Duels of the Planeswalker for them. So, that's me. Uh, hi, I'm Wolfgang Bauer. I am the founder and owner of Open Design, LLC. It's uh, small press RPG company that's been around for six years and also publishes a magazine called Cobalt Quarterly. Just this year we started winning some awards on our small books, Origins Award, uh, Any Awards, which has been very gratifying, but it's been six years in the making. Um, our motto is small but fierce, and our policy toward freelancers is we are perennially broke, but we will pay you. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Luke Crane. Uh, I published a role playing game called Burning Wheel um, uh, two, in 2002, about 10 years ago. Uh, I did that with a combination of a loan uh, from one of my friends and uh, saving up uh, quite a bit of money myself. And then since then, uh, I won awards 10 years ago. Nobody wants to give me any awards anymore. Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, I also have worked with Arkea, uh, publisher of Mouse Guard, to make the Mouse Guard role playing game, and uh, I am working with the uh, Henson Company to make role playing games for them right now, uh, in addition to continuing to publish uh, my own stuff. So I do mostly tabletop uh, role playing games. And as a plug, Mouse Guard is really awesome. Oh, yes. <laughs> it is. It has been across the street from us all day, and it's, it's fantastic. It's also won an award. Um, so. So, yeah, as so you, to start? yeah, as you can see, we all have a different, uh, we all have a range of experiences um, uh, from, you know, uh, uh, from card games, electronic design, um, small press publishing, uh, periodical design, periodical stuff, which is very, very different than publishing a book. Uh, Meg does uh, all of her stuff uh, via POD, uh, you know, and I bridge the gap. I do some POD, some print run stuff, and I'm sure you do runs? the same. Yes. yes. I yes. consider them print runs. Was it? I consider them print runs. Yeah. You do. Meg does print runs of the hundreds. Yes. Uh, in, on POD, whatever. Print. Uh, print, by print runs, I meant on a 
printing press. That's all. No, yes. No pejorative intended. Okay. Intended. You do beautiful. beautiful Go things. on. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the hell. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I just wanted to point out that uh, we have a, a range of experience up here and hopefully uh, can answer a lot of questions. And uh, I, I hopefully, one detail you may have also notice that I think most of us uh, have another gig uh, that we do. Very important. Keep your <laughs> so, uh, rule yeah. one, don't quit the day job. But what's rule two, right? Don't spend more than you can afford to lose. Yeah. I'm probably the one <laughs> I might be the one exception to not quitting your day job. Um, partly because of how we formed the company. Uh, Fire Opal is the biggest small company ever. Um, I have 30 people who I coordinate who haven't quit their day job. And so it's really an odd group. But with that said, I do everything possible to make sure they know rule one, don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are, there's the whole gamut. Some people will say quit your day job because it makes you want to be more motivated and, and finish faster and you well, have to do this and there's a lot of stress that comes around. Yeah. yeah, I mean you're very committed. Burn your bridge. Mm -hmm. Burn. <laughs> I am not in that, in that, in that, I want to do things the right way, be, not because I have to, because I have to put food on the table, but because I can. So that means that I, for, for the time being, I still have my day job. Right. And, and yeah, per, personal story wise, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to make books in the mid '90s, and I didn't know how. So I taught myself, and I taught myself how to use uh, layout design programs after hours at work. I was, you know, at, at a day job, and then once I kind of felt like I had my chops, I, I started working nights, and then would work on the design and publishing stuff during the day, and I did that for about six years, holding down uh, uh, two jobs before I moved kind of fully into the gaming industry, where I was working in gaming and working on my own publishing stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's a lot to handle. It's, uh, it's pretty stressful. But so, uh, any questions? So any, any questions so far based on our heartwarming uh, <laughs> uh, heartwarming tales over here? I have kind of a general question. Yeah, so, we have general answers. Give me a scenario, and then I'll ask a question. Um, so I've been working on a game for a while, a tabletop top game. Let's say it's a card game, um, and I've play tested it with a bunch of different groups of people. Um, I've iterated on it a lot. Uh, now I want to take the next step of trying to get it published. Um, so, what what step should I take to do that? Um, and at what point do I say, "F it, I'm going Kickstarter"? Mm, that's like a whole separate panel on yeah. Kickstarter. But F it, I'm going Kickstarter. That's the name of the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, I, I think there are two scenarios here. I think there's mm -hmm. the seeking out a publisher. Uh, scenario and the self-publishing uh, scenario. Yeah. You guys want to uh, talk I about mean, that? I would actually ask you a question first. What do you feel your competitive advantage is over every other card game out there? What distinguishes yourself and that inform would inform my answer dramatically? Yeah. What makes you stand out of this crowd? So I would just, I would say innovative mechanics that, sh that actually show themselves. Hmm. Um, like that. Is that something you can show to someone and prove to someone quickly and you've tried that with complete strangers and they've said, wow, well, yes? I haven't gotten to that point yet. Ah. That's my message. Mm -hmm. Get to that's that point, point before yeah. I invest the resources. You, got, you need to make that as something that will stand out so that you put it in front, I mean, from my side, I guess, and this is my answer. I would say that, look, you know, get to where, go to strangers, you've got to listen to critical advice. Well, the biggest problem I have is when come, people come up to me and say, hey, I've got this great game design, it's awesome, my playtest groups loves it, and what you've done is you've built a game for yourselves. Right. Yes. And not for anyone else. And you need to be able to take your game and show it, and they say, wow, that is actually the best idea I've seen. If they're a publisher, I want to publish to this. Mm -hmm. for a, this. Get a, a publisher is, sorry. A publisher, a publisher is going to be concerned with what they think they can sell. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But a, a so you want to get a prototype that yeah. you can bring to conventions yes. and play after hours with strangers? Yes. You want to find people that you don't know, like, he's, like, like Jay said, and see if your mechanics really are as gorgeous as you think? Hope, hopefully they are. Right, but I'm saying after that stuff. After that, yeah. you, you begin have, that's where you ha begin to have word of mouth and people talking about it, and then there's next steps that you guys can Right, and I mean, the self-publishing step is certainly one road. We can talk about the two possibilities, yeah. right? Sure. Uh, the self-publishing step is certainly one you could take if you have great confidence in it, if you feel you have the right contacts to, uh, to bring it to market, to publish a card game, um, or can, can find out. Uh, but also, if you have money to invest, Right uh, or a ton of time, 
to invest. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel that the reason you're seeking out a publisher is, you know, you don't have the resources or the time to make it happen, uh, then self-publishing is going to be a nightmare for mm -hmm. you because you are basically putting in sweat equity and making a lot of mistakes as a self-publisher um, because that's the only way you're going to learn, right? But if you want to have maximum control of where your game goes, self-publishing is the key. Yep. So one of the great things about self-publishing, though, and about just diving in and doing it, and I'm yeah. not endorsing this, is that you don't know all the fucking mistakes you're making, um, and you don't care. You're like, you're I blissfully person. unaware. Right. It's awesome. And when you look it's back, great. you look totally. at the wreckage of your life behind you. Um, you're like, fall, oh, yeah. And then uh, that's what did I do? This is a great game. But I mean, there is a benefit of just kind of the ignorance is bliss. But but just also to more practically, Jay, what do you think for a, for a thousand decks for a, a trading card game? What sixty cards a deck? Like twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars, full color for oh a print run. Oh God, for a print run for that, it depends on the quality you're trying to do. Uh, we just did a set of what six cents each is not unheard of per card. You can do the math from there. Yeah, so it's got a quote of four, four to uh, six point five cents. Yeah, uh, right. so six cents. You know, take five cents to start your envelope calculation. And go from there. Right. Card games are great because you yeah, have a 60 card deck, no problem, times 1,000. Right. <laughs> That's how many cards you're printing. Uh, so, yeah, if you have that, if you've worked in the tech industry and you're looking for, the, you know, for a career change, uh, some spend your retirement savings on, yeah. uh, people do it. Uh, it's not a bad idea necessarily, right? If you have something hot and you want to put the money into it and take a risk, then go for it. Yeah. And that was how Wizards started. They showed up at cons, rented booths, had Richard and Peter and friends sitting there playing cards with people, selling boxes from the back of a pickup truck. They yep. delivered. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, but, uh, I mean, they were also replicating Magic's success. It's, it's just, not going to happen. Yeah, it's not going to happen. It's never, it hasn't been done. Um, it's something new has got to come along. I mean, statistically, and you have to be realistic and be statistical, 99.9% .9 of all the games that you people have are going to be worse than Magic. Magic just has that. I mean, Magic is a great concept game. That it's been proven for you know, going on 20 years now, and nothing has really pushed it. Um, there's been, there are advantages here and there, but it's hard to beat something that's really good and entrenched. Sure. Well, you want to find another angle. You look at something like Munchkin, it's a card game. It is. It's hugely successful. It is. It is not a competitor to Magic. Not right? at all. Right. So. <laughs> and, right. And that, I, I don't want to say that you should be measuring yourself to Dungeons and Dragons or Magic or Mass Effect or whatever you're making. You don't have to measure yourself up to top tier stuff. Uh, there's lots of d different grades of success and engagement uh, in the publishing world beneath you know, being uh, you know a multi-million dollar company, uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's not what we're saying. We're just kind of painting a, the spectrum there. But uh, just before we move on, uh, you're not ready to publish yet. You 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 understand that, right? Yes. You're cha you're chomping yeah. at the bit, and you want to publish, but you've got a whole other stage of pain of play testing and prototyping. Yeah, I didn't. I'm a game designer at my day job, so. Uh, so you know about that pain. Great. Okay. Yay. Great, great. Okay. So, uh, next question. Thanks, Grace. Uh, uh, that guy was actually second. Oh, that guy was second? Uh, yeah, he was on the okay. speed band, so. All right. Yeah. I, work in, uh, I work with a group on a uh, video game, so it's very different from cards, but we do have um, one common problem I'm sure you guys have faced is managing time between your day job and building, you know, building your game. Okay. Uh -huh. So how do you do that? Balancing between the two. I think I, I think I'm doing uh, I, I think I'm doing okay, but even I sometimes struggle with it, and I know some members of my group definitely struggle with it too. What uh, what advice would you give for being able to balance between difficult schedules and okay. stay motivated in a situation like that? I got that. First thing, do you have a writing implement and something to write on within hand's reach? Don't do it. I'm just asking. Okay, that's part of it. Always have something on you to get your ideas out. I don't care if it's technological, iPhone-y, whatever. Um, but that's part of time management. I have a job. My husband has a job. We have three kids. We have other things we want to be doing. Finding the times in time management to do our design process means being aware that that is something that we are always doing. 
and finding the little tiny moments when we're in line at the grocery store or we're waiting for our coffee or whatever. Sometimes we get to set aside whole blocks of time. I got to say to my family, okay, in the month of June this year, I am writing a book. Don't bother me. <laughs> um, it pretty much worked. Pretty much. Um, but time management, first of all, I think it's really personal. Everybody's got a different Everyone bit of different. style. There are books and books and books and classes and whole courses of business school that you can take on time management. But the first thing is to be aware that you have a thing you want to be doing. So if you're doing something else, like waiting in line, and you could be thinking about something, use that time. Subway rides. Subway car, rides. Car rides. Oh, yeah. You're listening to podcasts is research and car rides. Yeah. I've become extremely like selfish about all of those moments, right? Like bus mm -hmm. time, sitting around at the grocery store time. That's all valuable. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I, I have to say I've thrown big chunks of stuff out of my life, right? When uh, starting up Open Design, I was doing a ton of work because I didn't have money to pay. So I basically gave up television. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't go to the movies. My gaming life is turned into my playtest life. That sucked. Oh, God. <laughs> um, oh, God. And I've dialed it back since then, right? I've, I've been able to work with other people, find resources, find ways to delegate things. Um, but it may be that for a considerable stretch of your life, you are um, you're a bad friend. <laughs> <laughs> that can happen. Watch this if you are in a relationship that you want to keep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What, what the fire hole guys? The, the guys, the, the guys with day jobs. Yeah. What's common to all of us is we're all different in that we, you know, we have different uh, rhythms and oh, we're we're on fire at, 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 at this point of our of our of, of the week or whatever, and and you know we can we can go like 100 miles an hour and and, and we love it. Uh, we're, we all have different rhythms and such, um, different passions, uh, but we all have something in common, and that is time is finite for all of us. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out some way to know ourselves, know what drives us, and and be able to use that. Um, what doesn't work for me, for example, is saying, okay, on this day, uh, Wednesday, it's Sunday today, well, on Wednesday I'm going to set aside two hours for working on my project. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, that guarantees that I will not be working on my project <laughs> on Wednesday for those two hours. So what I have to do is recognize that there are going to be times where I'm super driven and 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 then you know I can I can shut down everything else and just, just plow into whatever I'm plowing into. Um, but also that there are other times that are very valuable that are just like a minute here, a minute there. Realize that there's not always not everything in your project has to have a giant block of time. Uh, you can you can do things uh, that are very valuable uh, if you have your pen and paper handy, yeah. and 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 even when you don't have the passion, you know. Oh, I gotta do that thing. Oh my gosh, I wish I could just sit here. I'm so tired. Just just have something that's have a list of things that you really like doing that are only going to take like two minutes. That gets your mind in the mood, and and that gets you. Oh, I did this thing. Oh, that's a success. It only took me two minutes. Well, maybe I'll just work for five minutes more. Yeah. And there you go. Right. Yeah. And, and my experience is very similar to Wolfgang's. Uh, uh, Chats too. The. Um, I mean, obviously, your your workflow and your personal life are personal, and they're your own. You're going to find your own rhythms. Um, uh, but you, if you're serious about starting a company, starting an endeavor in, in any respect, you. You have to dedicate yourself to it. Otherwise, it's just going to idle in the background yeah. forever, and you've got to be prepared to make that push. And right, that means being a bad friend. That means no Xbox. It means no TV. Yeah. Um, right, and and it means doing hard things that there's like you would rather go to PAX, but you need to hit a deadline, right? Yeah. Uh, and you got to make difficult choices. It's not going to be forever, though. Like either it's going to work or it's not. But you got to put in the time uh, and effort. And and just from my own personal method, like. Uh, you know, I apologize to the people I love that are around me, and I. And sometimes when the you know when the fire takes me, I say I'm am sorry. I can't. I can't. You're forgiven. Yeah, I, I have got to do this. I have to write this right now. And sometimes um, it's four in the morning. But uh, and, and then just the last thing is I try to game design myself, and I try to do the hard thing and then reward myself a little bit. Like so, if I write this page or this chapter, 
I can play Xbox, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'll tell you, it works. <laughs> One thing that also works for me is, uh, well, first of all, maybe two things. Uh, getting up early. Get up early, mm -hmm. do your thing is the first <laughs> thing is <laughs> of, of, of first part of the day. You work in the middle of the night. There's no one else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the second thing is when that difficult choice comes, oh, should I watch the latest episode of such and such or should I, should I work on my game or whatever, um, don't think of the decision as how you feel right then because obviously you'll want to watch the latest episode of whatever. Think of what you want to have a year from now or yeah. six months from now. Yeah. Put yourself in that position and feel how it's going to feel. Mm -hmm. That will help you make your decision to work. Yes. So I wanted to put in a point because I think your question was actually asking from a software perspective, if that's correct. So, so in my particular case, I so I'm the person who's working on games full time, but I'm managing groups of people who have to balance life work. And what I found is that I take teams that are software, my software teams work on specific times together because I have to have a group of four or five people all working at once to collaborate. So what's worked for us over time has been we have teams that work for four or five hours on this particular night, all of us on Skype communicating. And then we have a build meeting, and we repeat this process and get into a rhythm every week of this team doing exactly the same way. And where what the rhythm is for the team is going to be project and person oriented. But the important thing here is to get that rhythm, build that rhythm once you've found what works. Don't be afraid to change until you get there. And then rinse and repeat until you're done. Great. Well, in terms of meetings to keep communication, we already have that. You know, okay. we've, built, cool. we've, we've built that schedule, and it happens every week unless the, unless the sky falls. Excellent. So, cool. We're going to move on. Uh, we had another question down front. Yes. Let's have over two. We have double. Kind of the same as the last question, but through a different lens, through uh, energy. How do you manage your energy? How do you keep yourself from oh, burning out? That's a really good question. Burn out's a lie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you can burn out. Like, we all it's like, possible. It's possible. Okay, this is where I'm going to say the exact opposite of we all, what we all just said. They're both true, okay? So always be using your time for the project that matters. Also, sometimes take a break. Sometimes you're going to be working on something so hard you get too close to it, and what you need is to go do something else, and that piece will fall into place. Um, also... Sometimes you're working on design, you're doing a thing, doing a thing, doing a thing, and, uh, and this other brilliant idea just is the shining beacon that you want. It's like, yeah. and you're, and you're like, I have to be doing this thing. I really need to write that chapter. But I really, really want to write this one about this new game about goblins and a mis they're miserable goblins and they're in a mine. Right? Miserable goblins. Um, <laughs> we started the last night. <laughs> awesome! So the point is, uh, sometimes your mind gets distracted in places like that, and you got to figure out whether that's, do I, is this taking a break while this percolates? Because that can happen. Or is this, that this is actually done, and this is where the real energy is? That's a very tricky place. But burnout, yeah, it's a thing that happens. Track, like, you can only have so many things going at once. Wolf King, how do you avoid burnout? Yeah, I'm like the worst guy to talk on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I just had the talk of, all right, what are we throwing off the schedule because I don't see you anymore? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, it was a serious conversation of, we're committed to all these projects, uh, Quarterly Magazine, all these books, uh, we've got a couple of Kickstarters, you know, we want to deliver. Mm. Uh, at the same time, um, I wasn't getting enough sleep. I uh, wasn't seeing the people I wanted to see, and so I said, all right, we got to cut 25% of the stuff for our 2013 calendar, yep. and just threw it overboard, and then, you know, I also heard, we're going on vacation. What, honey? <laughs> <laughs> what? No, I don't have time. We're going. This is really huge. That was really important to hear. One of the best things that we did to figure out, like, our work-life balance and the question of burnout is to get a big, not just a one... Put it on the wall. Digital's not going to cover that for you. You need to have it on the wall, those big, like, 15-month calendars. calendars, so you can see the flow. And you can see, because 
I like to do stuff. I'm like, oh, I can go to PAX and I can go to um, Retcon and I can go to Kineticon and I can go to this and I can go to, then I can go to PAX Prime. And if I put that on a calendar where my whole family can see it, I'm like, God, I'm busy every single weekend. Mm-hmm. And what you do then is you, you put the cool. red weekend that's exactly. called vacation weekend, you put that like Mark 12 that months in. out because that day will never come, right? <laughs> You'll be on top of all your deadlines Ooh. by then, so you can be committed a year in advance. Oh, but yeah. so, so that's, but that's really important. important. So you, you mark in your downtime. Make your commitment. And that, that gives you the downtime. downtime that lets you recharge so you don't burn out. It gives you that downtime from your project so you can like project, 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 project. God, it says vacation. Okay. Now I'm on the beach. Hey, I just solved the thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, you know? The, the way, just the way we work, uh, the way the human brain works is that uh, da- downtime isn't, it's not is, lost. downtime's very productive. Yeah. Uh, as we, it, it helps us uh, sort and filter uh, mm-hmm. through a lot of stuff. And, and you will come back and be able to work harder uh, through a, you know, harder and faster, basically, mm-hmm. after you give yourself a little. Time. Same with sleep. That's like regular downtime. Mm-hmm. Don't skimp on that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, vacations also. Planning a vacation at the end of a project, something I learned, it yeah. definitely helps the relationships. Yeah. yeah, you have to make sure you put yourself first. It's hard. So you are, you are your best one asset. Quick, one of the quick oh, yeah. So one thing that we did, we adopted a policy from Wizards. We closed down from December 15th to um, basically for roughly the first week in January. Everybody. 100%. No one's going to answer your emails. Uh, we just do it as a across the board. That's great. Everyone in Fire Opal, if you email me, I'm not going to respond to you in that time. That's great. Um, just press the board. Okay. So uh, you, you had a question. Uh, my question is about marketing. Uh, so let's say I have created a project. I've you know gone through the writing, the editing, the proofreading, the layout, the design. I have a PDF that is ready to go. Um, you know, I have I contacted a, a consigner, I'm going to sell it online, or you know, what have you. How do I, or, do, or what strategies would I adopt to get people to know that it's there, other than, well, word of mouth? Well, I would advertise in Cobalt Quarterly. Well, <laughs> 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 um, I mean, yeah, so I've seen this from both sides, right? Um, since I publish a periodical and it's about advertising, I think about this from both perspectives. Um, yeah. How do you find your audience? It's tough. Um, if you know where they hang out already, go there. Go there, right? Hang out in that forum. If you know that, uh, you know, 13th Age has a forum over on the Pelgrane Press site, then you could advertise just by showing up and being friendly mm-hmm. and talking about your product. This is amazing. It is, isn't <laughs> it? Holy cow. You should. <laughs> we'll swap later. But uh, I don't think there's a single answer to this, right? Marketing is one of those things I used to uh, denigrate as a profession because I didn't understand it. And I didn't understand why I needed to bother as a game designer, as an editor. Um, once your game is just sort of sitting there and not selling, suddenly the importance of marketing becomes very important. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's lots of ways you can go, right? There's print advertising and online advertising, banner ads, search, paid placements. AdWords and Google. AdWords and Google is great. But you have to see what the return is, right? If you spend 75 bucks on Google and you get $65 worth of sales, then it's not <laughs> the right keywords. So, I mean, I've advertised different projects completely differently yeah. and marketed them completely differently. Yeah, you really, you've got to find your audience and see how they interact with new, like getting new stuff um, and, and go in there. It's, it, advertising for gaming is hard, uh, or marketing for gaming is hard, but also kind of easy because, you know, you, you, there's, a pretty, there's a big box, but it's a box around your audience. You're not making a general purpose product. You're making something for gamers. Well, I know to some degree, of course, you know, I can go to the Paizo forums. I can go to EN World. You know, there, there's sure. a bunch of different places online. You go say, hey, here's a product. Here's a thing. Uh, so, you know, that's that's obviously a first step. Um, at, at what point, if there ever is even a point, would I want to move beyond, like, personally going out and buying, you know, ads or personally, you know, writing forum posts and maybe enlisting the services of a professional marketing person? So, can yeah. I answer your question uh, first you before you? Because I hit a back one. First of all, no marketing without having metrics, mm-hmm. ever. Um, you know, that's the most important thing. Know how many sales you get for every dollar you spend on marketing 
both estimated before and afterwards and know how you're going to track that. That's the mm -hmm. single most important thing to do. Then it really does get product specific. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are products that you do want to... We have, for 13th Age, a, a table in front of Indie Tabletop Gaming here at PAX because our audience are Indie Tabletop Gaming. We don't want to be on the Expo Hall. We want to be right in front of where all of our audience is going to walk by. But that's totally um, unapplicable to one of our digital games we're working on. Um, the digital games on the social network, you're using the digital social channels. And, you know, that's sort of what I would think before you were jumping into that. Well, I, I just wanted to... Okay, so Kickstarter, or Indiegogo. Um, when I look at those, I do not see this is how I raise money to do my project. project. Some people, it's wicked successful. Like, Go them. Awesome. And I think there's great things happening. But for me, because I'm a small self-publisher, um, that's marketing. You know, I just produced the second edition of A Thousand and One Nights, a game of Tyson stories. Um, I love this. I wanted lots of people to know about it. I had the product was done. This is important. Like done, done. Like ready to send to the printer. Done. Product was done. I had the cash in hand to print my first print book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I put up a kicks, uh, Indiegogo campaign for a thousand and one dollars. That filled in like five hours. I knew it would. I mean, it was not. This was not for like I'm gonna make a million dollars because that's it's marketing. I mean, Thirty days to say, oh, did you see this? Did you see this money? Oh, okay. And for me, I, that, I had seventy thousand, not seventy, seventeen thousand people. I'll check that out. For me, that's massive. Right. You know, yeah. and a fair portion of them are going to have bought the game already. You, you asked how, how do you know when to go hire somebody to do the marketing for you? Uh, the easy answer to that is if they can make more money uh, than you would uh, otherwise, that maybe there's an opportunity cost. Maybe you would be better suited doing some other development work. Uh, and, and so by not doing that, you're losing money. Or maybe they are very good at what they do and can bring you more than they cost, and you definitely don't want to hire and pay for anything that is going to cost more than you get. Well, I'm, I'm well aware that like marketing is not something that I have any knowledge of or how to do the yeah, like most basic uh, common sense and obvious level. So, it's, I mean, yeah, Jay, uh, Jay brings a pretty silly point about investing and you know, we we're getting uh, investing, but... Uh, and you're like, well, how, you know, how do I move beyond word of mouth? When do I hire? But also, I think if we zoom out a little bit and we're talking about startups here and self-publishing and whatnot, you also have to be honest with yourself. You have to wear all the hats. Yeah. And the things when you're like, well, I'm not very good at this. I guess I'll figure out how to get good at it <laughs> yes, myself. <laughs> you have to. You and Because one, no one else can do it for you. Uh, even your friend who's really, really good at selling used cars or whatever, Eventually, he's not going to want to do it for free anymore or whatever. Um, you should do the free things first. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah <laughs> tap into the free stuff until you, your friends hate you. But uh, <laughs> but you you got to figure it out. Because also, in the next stage, when you grow your company, when your product is a success and things are going great, you will understand who you need, right? And, and, and understand how to talk to someone and say, I, these are the things I've been doing. What more can you do for me? You know, uh, and you'll be able to interface with people that are you'll be able to interface with printers, you'll be able to interface with marketing people, programmers. So it's a question. Let's push to another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, Who we like? He's got tattoos on his arm. All right. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the pros and cons of, say, Kickstarter slash Indiegogo versus other methods of self publishing Sure. Yes. I know. <laughs> um, so when I when we started our publishing business ten years ago, we had sixty bucks that we could afford to burn. That was it. Um, so we made as many copies at the print shop as sixty bucks would get us, and we abandoned them on the doorsteps of local game shops, and nobody ever called us back. Do you know why? Because the game is called Kill Puppies for Sleep. This <laughs> 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 is a seriously funny game. But find it. It's Anyway, but we killed puppies for sake for a long time. It was the top hit for puppies on food. <laughs> but the point is, the, um, so funding, first off, don't spend more than you can afford to burn. And then at your funding sources, you figure out, like, okay, we're going to do now, there's Kickstarter and Indiegogo and things like that. 
those are great. They take care. They take really big hard metrics <coughs> and how much are you going to spend out in weeks and how much are you going to promise that you isn't completed and all those things. And then I, like other sources of funding is your last project ought to fund your next product and if it doesn't, you're in trouble. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, I think that's really key. I think pretty much all of us are here because of our last project. Right. If it wasn't for our last project, there'd be someone else sitting on these chairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'll count a series that's not performing, right? It's, uh, it, something's not working. Yeah. Like, it's time to say, all right, that thing, we're going to stop doing it. But for startup, like if you're looking, if you're looking to put together capital to do an initial, you know, initial thing, thing um, it's pretty 60 bucks. You know, there's some avenues, but things to think about there. Don't walk into your house. Don't max out a credit card your partner doesn't know you have. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually looking for uh, uh, investors in my new website. And actually, it's called Designer. And the more people that back it, the better the design gets. And the, the better, the, more, the closer to done. And it, so if it's funded, then the design is done. And it's and the more overfunded it becomes, the better it becomes. Uh, the, the the what I'm saying here is Kickstarter doesn't design your game. No. Kickstarter doesn't make your product. No. Right. It, so, but so it's enticing because honestly, there's Kickstarter is hot, and is hot, and people are throwing money at it. It is the way to get buzz and to, to market your game. I mean, you guys it is, but, right but at some yeah. point, we're going to see the backlash yeah. against yeah. projects yeah. that flop, yeah. right? right? That don't right. deliver. That's why, like, have it done. Have it so have done. it done. I'm right. right on that. Yeah, I have sort of, I personally think that, and I'll go on the record for this on tape, that I suspect there's going to be a massive backlash in 12 months against Kickstarter's or any go goes. When roughly a week after the New York Times covers an article on a Kickstarter that Cause something horrible to 100,000 people, um, each of whom contributed 100 or more dollars, um, you're going to see a massive backlash. And so the way things are now will be different. But I think that massive backlash will accrue to the four fools who put that Indiegogo or Kickstarter in, rather than the system as a whole. I think there will still be companies able to do it because they have built a reputation for success in those venues. Possibly. It's just I think the world will change at that point. Oh, yeah. It won't be as easy. The, the buzz will... You can walk out and... The halo will disappear. So, right. Let, let's, like, if you're not going to get started, like, if that wasn't well, on the table... But I would say just, there's no point not to do it. <laughs> They're like, there's just there's no reason not to do a Kickstarter right now. Okay. But to, to do your Kickstarter, make sure your game is done. Now, don't be don't be the reason that that it flames out for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know we talked about um, trying not to burn out, and managing our time, or staying motivated on a whole project. Um, what suggestions would would you give? What practices would you suggest when we're dealing with the whole team? Because sometimes we may be able to stay motivated, we may be able to keep ourselves burned out and all that, all that jazz. But we need our team there, you know, and uh, that may be much more challenging endeavor than. Okay. How, how do you, you want to talk more about Well, that's, so, as I was saying, first of all, the vacation holds now at the end of the year. You're not going to get a game published between December and the start of the new year. You're honestly not going to give any effective work out of your people in those times. Close down. It is whoever the focal point is time. So you get a couple of good weeks there. Everybody knows it. And literally shut down the emails. Don't even bother to check it. So that's one strong thing. The other item is people are going to take vacations at other points. And hopefully your team can handle one person missing a week or a few days there. Sometimes people aren't going to be motivated. Yes. And sometimes you just have to have expectations yeah. and responsibilities. And you have to deliver. What you have to be willing to cut some if they're not doing it. Like, if you're like, okay, here's my product, and I've hired an editor to do the editing. Because I want to. <laughs> Why? Well, if they don't follow through, you've got to be ready to eat. Say, Sorry, that's not working out. Art direction, learn how to do that. It's hard, but you have to know what your vision is and what you want from the people you want to work with. What, a, what, a, what other point is that when you do have to lay someone off, your wife is going to be really mad at you. 
And I wish I was kidding, but it's not my case. It honestly hasn't been my wife, but it's going to be your friends. It's hard. And it is really hard to tell a friend of yours who you probably worked with for years previously that for whatever reason you don't have the work at home to. And so just be aware. You have to do it, and it's going to be someone you never imagined and you like a lot, yeah. and they let you down, and both parties know. Yeah. Um, just to, to follow up on that, like I've had that experience multiple times, and uh, I, I pretty much work alone. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I've worked in, in the contract work. I've worked with a partner, uh, worked in teams. I hate working in teams. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, but for but as the uh, but I do well kind of in a like the design directorial position uh, because I'll just shoulder the work. Right when somebody's slacking, I'll just be like fuck it and, yeah. and just do it. But uh, and. But also, it would, from a startup position, from the, the idea that you have to wear all these hats, you've got to do all this crazy work, you have to commit, you're going to burn out, whether you like it or not. Um, I, what I've learned in dealing with my friends is just to accept whatever gifts they give. If they read one chapter, great. Right? If they do one illustration, amazing. If they don't want to do any of that stuff or they get halfway through it, it's cool. I'd rather be friends. Yeah. Right? And, it, and <laughs> if I paid them, I'm the fool. Right, <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get hung up about money with my friends or anything like that. But I, just, I really, people love to support these crazy, scrappy endeavors, and so I've just learned, like, we have something, we have a process that we call the weekend of pain, uh, where at the well, end, that sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of, uh, at the end of a project, I invite everyone over. It's a, it starts Friday night, goes to Sunday night, and you just get to destroy whatever we made, uh, you know, before we send it off the press. Like, the design's done, editing's done. Done and uh, and you know off we go we, and we just hack it to pieces and it's amazing I get people who have day job professional lives like who self publish their own stuff who just really want to pitch in and like they can't do something you know week to week or whatever but at the end of a project you know once a year basically they'll come by for us and and, uh, and read a chapter and carve it up with a red pen can I say uh, the sorry yo go ahead the number one factor in my opinion. For success or failure is starting with the right scope. And if you haven't done anything before, you better start small. And then when you cut think you have half. something small, you better cut it in half. Seriously, because but when you can see success, it will it will grow. But if you can't see that, then then you're stuck. Put the hat in the back. I'm just curious, how much did your significant other play in your creative role? My my husband and I are it's. We, it's a creative thing. We do it together. Um, he has, like, dogs in the vineyard and pocket's world um, are things that he had his name on. I read every single word of both of those. I had definite impact into the, the book design, the rules. Pocket's world was written for me. It has rules that I want, that I want to play. The rest of you are lucky. It says so in the book. <laughs> so, um, with my husband, it, it, even to Baker, it's... It's a thing we do together. We didn't part, start putting both of our names on it until we went to Italy and saw a couple of couples that were doing it more aware. Like, oh, wow. That, yeah. What? So that's how it is in our house. We take turns writing books. This is very important. That there's books that are projects that are really his idea. Like, he, he's got the spark of it. He's got the, the design. And I'm helping out and refining it. Maybe this and that. We're both thinking about it. But he's really caring. The weight falls on his shoulders at the end of the day. And then there's projects that like design, game designs that I'm doing. This is really my thing. And he's helping out and all that other stuff. We take turns because we have three kids, right? We'll see. Wow, that doesn't sound like my life at all. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would say my wife is carrying a huge part of the burden. It's not the creative part of the business. And she doesn't want it, right? She doesn't write. Uh, she's not an illustrator. She doesn't do layout. Those things, um, she just I trust you with that. Well, great. Well, the weight of that is all on me. Um, but when it comes to, uh, wow, everything else, shipping, accounting, customer service, ad sales for the magazine, it's huge. I mean, she's holding five or six hats and doing them all splendid. Um, and that buys time for me to do game design and editing and working with uh, the layout and the art people. So it's a different partnership where we just said we're splitting the roles this way. And it works for us. Great. Uh, take another question. Oh, 
Oh, either way, I would say that in my case, my wife keeps all my games. Oh. <laughs> Every single one of them. She's a consummate gamer. Uh, you know, I had a game sitting on the best selling list for a year, and she didn't even play it. <laughs> it's just not her style. She's actually suggested me that she's not going to make my panel because there's one that was more interesting. <laughs> she's a consummate gamer, and she does help with the company stuff. And it's the same thing you were saying. Um, her day job, she does actuarial work, and she certainly helps me with contracts and paperwork and things of that side. All right, skills. Clothing designer, dude in the back? Oh, yes. Um, so I'm in the very, very early phases of Valor uh, and Ask Man. Later down the road. Uh, it's a tabletop RPG, and specifically for tabletop games, what's your feelings about trying to create your own game mechanic for it versus using something open license? Don't do that. Wait, wait, wait. It's a giant can of worms, but um, sure, it's a great can of worms. I love it. Uh, for me, I mean, I worked at TSR. I worked at Wizards of the Coast. When the Open Game License came along, I said, wow, that's cool. I'll just publish my own stuff under this license over here. Uh, it was an opportunity for me to take an existing set of skills and background and say, okay, I can, I can do this. I think there's nothing wrong with starting uh, to write a wholly new set of mechanics. And I mean, Monty Cook is doing this now, right? He is Mr. Third Edition D&D. He certainly knows the open game license, but his current project uh, is a new set of mechanics. You can have success either way. Uh, what you get with the open game license, of course, is a built-in audience of people who like that, who may like the D20 material you're doing. Um, and companies like Green Ronin or Open Design have built their success on it. So, to step back a little bit from my knee-jerk reaction, don't do that. <laughs> what you want, when you're, when you're looking at the mechanics for your game, you're doing tabletop, or, um, whatever, you're doing tabletop, open design, you want to figure out what the mechanics are that fit your game. They're, they may be out there. You may be like, yeah, I'm totally building on a D20 engine. I'm totally going to build on a GURPS engine or a Pocket World engine or the Burning Whip. You know, you may find something that works great, but if it doesn't, it's going to show at every juncture where your rules intersect your, your design. And so figure out that what the design of the mechanics fits your game. That's something I want to jump in on as well. That uh, when I, I teach over the UW in game design, one of my lectures is making mechanics fit the message. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely key. There are elements of any game mechanic that work with work with or against the story. Um, and it is really critical that I mean, if your game needs the, the mechanics of OGL work, use them. Uh, it's a subset work. Uh, there is a really good article in a game called Train. If y'all haven't read it, make sure to search online when you go home on the articles on Train, and you'll see a better, um, you know, better understanding of anything I can say in a minute or two. Uh, and to answer from our side of things, just from Fire Opals, um, our answer was, well, we took the OGL license and merged a lot into it because we were trying to build a traditional fantasy game that was evocative of our two primary authors, Kanto and Tweet. Mm -hmm. So we use OGL intentionally and basically use it as a platform of, hey, let's sort of do the game that OGL did, Jonathan and Rob want to play. And that was sort of what our design was. So of course, D20 fit that message. You have to know your audience, too. Uh, it is advantageous to make a game that you can teach somebody else in five minutes because they already know all the mechanics. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Go ahead. You're, you're great. You're, you're, you're a model. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, can you talk about the biggest failure that you've experienced in your Oh, just one? <laughs> the biggest failure we've had as, as designers in this process? Or sure. publishers, Fantastic. right? Oh, I, I, what, right. I mean, I hope we all have a stream of failures like I do, right? Uh, uh, let's see. The, the, um, I, just, I spent three years working on a game, very expensive, beautiful, to produce game, uh, published you know, it was 2007, 2010. Uh, didn't sell very well. Um, I love the game. I adore it. it just didn't, it just doesn't sell very well. But the the thing that the heartbreaker is that I, since like 2004, I've been 
trying to get out this idea for a post-apocalyptic game, that, and I cannot do it. I published it even, and then I I published a book and a PDF and then pulled them back because uh, they just that just doesn't work. So uh, it, so I mean, on one side, the one is design success and financial ruin, and uh, and on the other side, it's just this like this inability to make this design work. Yeah. Uh, there's so many wonderful examples I could choose from, <laughs> but I'm going to go with one that's moderately recent and still freshly scabbed over. Um, I wanted to release a product in time for a convention, and it was running a little behind, and I had gotten it edited and laid out, and it was going on to press, and I, I realized we were just late enough that if I ordered the proof copy, come in from the printer... And when I would check it, I would miss my convention date. And I said, damn it, I'm going to release this at the convention. I've worked with this printer so many times before. What could possibly oh, go, go wrong? wrong? <laughs> you underestimated Murphy. Yeah, I totally did. And so, you know, I said, all right, we're just going to, it was a print-on-demand thing. So it's like, well, the risk is only, you know, a couple hundred copies. And they all showed up, and every single cover was a gray gradient with the author's name in the corner. <laughs> and I, like, the interior was perfect. There was just no cover. <laughs> so I said, well, I could take these to the convention. <laughs> so, you know, I took a shortcut, and I paid for it, and basically ate the cost and had to print it again. Wow. I'm not doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> so... I'd say from fire oak perspective, I'm going to leave off my wizard's failures because y'all don't care about those. <laughs> um, the, uh, probably the biggest that we had is we, I certainly overextend in a lot of ways. When we set up fire oak, well, we had a bunch of people from wizards R&D. I literally had my pick and choice of the pool of, to be honest, the best known game designers and most experienced people and trying to do too much and not cutting the scope in half, and not limiting and not saying, hey, you awesome person who are one of the world's best at this, no, I'm not going to work, let you work for me, even working for ownership in the organization. Um, we went, I mean, we actually have 60 people on our books, which is an insane number. I yeah. Think. For a startup? For a yeah. startup. We have 30, I mean, I can actually manage 30, which is, people tell me it's an insane number, but I'm a, but it's a manageable number. But that is my day job to do that and to make sure they're coordinated. But we did go too far. And it had long repercussions. And I'm still paying for massive amounts of overtime to fix the problems from having that. So. Uh, our biggest failures are design, like our design things. We are small enough that we really can't afford massive financial failures. Um, so sometimes we spend a lot of energy on a game that we love. And get fairly, and it just doesn't hit, and we just have to kill our darlings and put them on a shelf, and maybe we get to sabotage and cannibalize them later if it's part of the game. Um, the only real failure that we've taken to market uh, is in Engage that Vincent took to market. Art's gorgeous, game works, people love this game. It's not where we want it to be. You know, so we're actually considering pulling that back and seeing if we can retool it. Because even though it's getting like, oh my god, it's just great, it's great, I love it. We're gonna get more of it. It's not it's not working. Chad, what about you? My biggest failures are the projects that I or I thought they weren't good enough because I'm a perfectionist. So my advice I, this is something I've been working on. Things don't have to be perfect. You can iterate on them. You can release, especially in a digital world, you can you can release something that has the minimum kernel of what you want. And if it's, it's good, you can go back to it later, you can add features, you can change things, but get it out there. Don't let it languish. Cool. cool. Uh, so we have time for one more question. We'll do a lightning round. Um, <coughs> so we'll try, everybody try to pitch in as briefly as possible. So Meg, go ahead and blindly pick. Red hand. If you have one piece of advice, what would you say? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you saved the juggernaut. Just do it. All right. The, 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 the standard never, uh, the, or the standard one piece of advice at the end of the con is never surrender, never give up. Yep. Pretty much. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but Lauren. Ah. Good, yeah. If you had a dream way to get your product to the people who loved it, what would it be? Inception. Oh. <laughs> 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 a dream way to get my product to the people who love it. Oh, parachute. <laughs> it's called on the OS when they first try that machine. <laughs> yeah. You, Michael. Free with every iPad. <laughs> oh, no, installed on every iPad. Installed on All right, uh, well, lightning round continues. We go four more. Uh, uh, are setting heavy tabletop RPGs like uh, Eclipse Plays or Exalted uh, viable? And Eclipse Face did very well. Yep. Uh, no sure. one's no one's living on Eclipse Face though. Don't think anyone's paying their rent, but it sold very well. Mm-hmm. All right. So, uh, they, they, so they are viable. Yeah. Well, they're they're commercially good. viable, but yeah, are they financially viable? Well, someone made money. They, they make money. They pay. They just don't pay a staff. Right. right. I mean, they, there's like six guys that work on that. Thirteen stage is pretty setting heavy as we go, certainly. <laughs> and you know, but again, tabletop RPGs are a terrible business model. I'm going to sell you a product that I worked really fucking hard on for a really long time that you only need to buy once and then you can play it forever and it's really cheap. <laughs> and you can play it with any number of people. That's There's the more design ever. in any of our products than in something like Skyrim. Yeah. And guess what? They make money in the accounts from the tens to hundreds of millions. We make money that's counted the tens to hundreds of thousands. We're lucky. Yeah. We're Sometimes lucky. the tens. All right. Uh, so lightning round continues. Back there. Uh, oh. If you were to, what would you say is the biggest unseen curveball for somebody who's walking into managing a creative collaborative process? <laughs> oh, man. Oh. <laughs> Only one? One curveball in managing creative Biggest. 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 Well, who's going to disappoint you? Or who's who's going to disappoint you? Ooh, yeah. All right. Good answer. Next question. Green shirt right here. <laughs> All right. Panel's called, you know, the ramen noodle budget. I know you're a rice and beans man. Yes. What is your cheap, oh, my God, we got to pay publishing costs and rent, but I also want to eat sometime this week. That's great. So, uh, do you want us to give you our favorite cheap meals? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your $5 favorite cheap meal. Rice and beans. Oh. Yeah, beans and rice is good. <laughs> Do you want to call it a new meal? It doesn't work. Eastern, <laughs> falafel sandwiches. Yeah, you want to look at Middle Eastern cuisine? It's really cheap. It's really good. Hey, lightning round. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, lightning round continues. This has to be a business license, uh, accounting, yes. that kind of thing. Yes. Don't get stuck. LLC. I mean, ha- incorporation, this kind of thing. You don't have to incorporate. Business. You can be a sole proprietor when you're starting, when you're small. Starting, when you're small. Um, but you do need a business license if you're planning on selling anything direct. You should, yeah, sole proprietorship should require a business license too, but... Uh, yeah. Find someone who can mentor you. Yes. D- but don't buy into the business thing too soon, too early! Yes. No, no, but find something key is when you do, find a mentor that you trust. All right, lightning round continues. One, two, three, go. Um, when do you move from showing your game to friends and family to a that does with strength? When you've got it as done as you can. Strive for excellence, not perfection. When you start to drool, uh, what do I do now? Before then, my uh, time, he wants me to. Uh, t- yeah. Tabletop RPGs, how much is story, how much is mechanics? All mechanics. Next question. All story. All story. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was the quantity of your first edition? Quantity of 1,036. In terms of? How many, how many did you have for it? How many copies First you have product. Uh, 75. No comment. Very large. <laughs> I, think when, I think I would consider Dogs in the Vineyard at first. I think we printed 300. Next, uh, next question. question. One more. Yeah. Or, or less. Or, uh, you said your first budget was $60. Yeah. Do you have any, like, really cheap, like, even if it's just, like, glue is 10 cents cheaper at Walmart? <laughs> like, what, what saves you money? Do everything you can by hand yourself. God. Got print. Got print. Really? Okay, so got print. Dot net. Got print. Dot net. Cheaper than Vista print, and way cheaper than Kingdoms. And we're done. Yay. Thank you.